Blessed morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. Yeah. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Amen. Well, first and foremost, I would like to thank God for the uh, for guiding my wife for her successful operation, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for the prayers that you have given my wife and uh, my family. So she's a bit sore, but. Uh, she will be okay. I keep on telling her that uh, she will be fine because the Lord is with her. Right? And uh, before I go on, um, let me uh, greet uh, one of our visitors, Lee. Thank you very much, Lee, for uh, visiting us. I hope that uh, you will have a uh, blessed experience this morning with us. And uh, all of us here um, have taken, those that are driving, you have taken your uh, license exam, your behind the wheel exam, right? And uh, you still remember that you still have what they call the blind spot. You still remember the blind spot when you are driving, right? So um, a blind spot, is actually the area of the road that cannot be seen by looking forward okay, through your window screen or by using your rear view and side view mirrors. And uh, blind spots can be large enough in size to easily block uh, another car or motorbike, cyclists or pedestrians from your view according to uh, the AA.com. Now, here is a view of the so-called blind spot. Okay. The area you can see through your rear view mirror and the area that you can see without moving your head. So there you have on the side, the blind spot. Now, one survey by the uh, DAA.com uh, showed that nine out of 10 divers admitted, you know, <clears throat> they are <clears throat> finding it hard to see cyclists or, or uh, motorcycle uh, bikers. And 55% of drivers are often surprised by a sudden appearance or appearing of a uh, cyclist or a motorcyclist out of nowhere okay, because of that blind spot. That's why we always look at our mirrors, side view mirrors, rear view mirrors, you know, and uh, we always do a shoulder check. <laughs> shoulder check. That was I was told when I uh, about to take my uh, behind the wheel exam that you should do your head check. All right. So practice that. Now, but if you are in my country, or add in other uh, third world countries, you have to constantly move your eyes while driving. And you have to constantly move your head. Okay. All right? Because, you know, if you ever driven in the busy streets in the Philippines, and especially in Metro Manila, do know what I'm talking about. Not only that you have to contend with vehicles coming in all directions, you also have to contend yourself with pedestrians, you know, crossing all over whenever and where and wherever they want. And you also have to contend with other uh, peddlers or street vendors. So you have the you have the vehicles, you have the pedestrians, the people, and you have all those selling uh, on the streets. 
So you have to contend with all of, all of those things. You have to constantly move your head. I, I, I saw a one uh, YouTube video of an American guy who went to the Philippines and tried driving in the streets in the Philippines. And he was like, it's crazy out there, you know. And I've heard one, uh, one missionary who came to the Philippines, and then uh, he, he, he told us that uh, I thought that if you can drive in New York City, you can drive anywhere in the world. But I was wrong. If you can drive in Metro Manila, then you can drive anywhere in the world. <laughs> you know, the traffic is so, so, crazy. so crazy. You can actually, um, when you are at stop, you can actually touch the person of the other vehicle. Yeah. So that's how close we are. That's how close Filipinos are. <laughs> Mostly needed, even in the, in the traffic, we're so close. So, now, a blind spot, again, it's an area on a vehicle where you cannot see other vehicles, right? And uh, even if you look in your side mirrors, your rear view mirrors, there are still those blind spots. And um, I found this interesting when I was trying to review for my behind the wheel exam here in California. You know, there is what they call a no zone, especially if you are... Uh, uh, driving behind or beside a truck, okay? There is what they call a no zone. So we have to be very careful. Okay? As you can see there, that those are the blind spots. If you drive very near at the truck, the driver won't be able to see you because that's the blind spot. So you have to know where you are driving, especially when you are close to a truck. Right now, the the National Highway Traffic Administration estimates that around 800,000 blind spot accidents occur in the U.S. every year. That's a big number. Okay. Now here's another blind spot. I hope you're not parking the way this guy is parking. So this is a blind spot, actually, what we call blind curve. Because come here, if you're going to turn right, you cannot see if there's somebody or any blockage um, near that uh, SUV. So that's actually a blind spot. And you are not allowed to park in that spot. Because according to law, if, there's a, uh, if you are near a crossing or intersection, you cannot park 20 feet from it. But if there is actually a no a stop uh, sign post, you cannot park within 30 feet. That's according to uh, California law. Now, as we can see, knowing these blind spots will actually save your lives and will actually also save other people's lives and avoid damages. And it's really dangerous. So we have to know your, your blind spot. Now, in psychology, a blind spot is a cognitive bias that causes people to be less aware of their own biases than of others <clears throat> and to assume that they are less susceptible to biases than others. Okay? Now, a blind spot simply means my perception, my judgment, my opinion are very much objective than yours. I am correct, you are not. Okay? And um, I am ruling out the possibility of having my own biases. Following? Okay. Now, take for example in politics. For example, when you're a pro-Democrat, I believe Biden, President Biden is a Democrat. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But um, if you're a pro-Democrat, when we try to analyze their reasonings and judgment, and we differ our opinions and our judgment from theirs, somehow we are quick to, to say that they are biased. That they are biased in their reasonings and judgments because they are pro-administration or pro-democrats. Okay? Well, of course, they are favoring those that are in the administration. And we will say that our opinion is an objective one okay? because we are not favoring any other side. Though, Though, 
we are ourselves a pro-Republican. So we are likely, likely to, less likely to see our own biases, and we are more prone to see other, other people's biases. Are you following? Okay. Now, there was an experiment. There was an experiment made with 661 Americans. Now, out of those 661, only one believed that he was more biased than the average American. You see, out of the 661, only one believed. Then the, the rest, they believe that they are not biased in their own opinion, in their own judgment. Now, the problem with blind spots is we tend to think that we are more rational, that I am more rational and I am more correct in my thinking than your thinking. Okay? Because we believe that our judgment are not influenced by any biases. Right? But eventually, we may even tend to force, okay? we may even tend to force our so-called better judgment on other people or the lack of our better judgment. We are trying to force that judgment of ours to other people as a source of accurate conclusions. Therefore, making my judgment, or again, the lack of it, being the authority, and yours are not. That's blind spot. Okay. So, with that said, there is also what we call a spiritual blind spot. And this morning, that is what we are going to talk about. My spiritual blind spot, our spiritual blind spots. In our scripture reading, Matthew chapter 7, 3 to 5, and why do you look at the speck on your brother's eyes, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. These are the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me read to you the New Living uh, Translation about Matthew chapter 7, particularly verse 5. It says, you who pretend to be someone, pretender, pretending, you who pretend to be someone, you are not. So normally in blind spots, we overemphasize, we overestimate our own abilities. We are not seeing our own weaknesses, our own flaws, our own faults. But rather, we are quick to see the flaws and faults of other people. Now, Jesus Christ tells us, you who pretend to be someone you are not, first take the big piece of wood out of your own eye. Then you can see clearly or better to take the small piece of wood out of your brother's eye. Some people tend to see the fault and the flaws of other people while never their own faults or never their own flaws. It is because of our own hypocritical view of ourselves as better than other people. But the truth is, we have, according to Jesus Christ, we have a bigger piece of the wood or plank in our own eyes. Bigger flaws. So many faults than most people. Okay. We just don't see them because we are just so naive. We are so naive of ourselves. We don't see our own flaws and we don't see our own faults. Now, biblical blind spots, they are a negative characteristic of a person who ignores biblical truths in exchange for personal biases now, affected by emotions. Our biases, they are affected by our emotions. They are affected by our relationships, by our uh, affiliations. If you are affiliated to a certain group, then you are more prone to be biased to them. Okay. And also to your own observations. And finally, to, to our own intelligence. Okay. 
because people who have so many learnings will try to see the bias in others but won't see this bias in, the, in his own self. Okay. Number one is the emotional blind spot. Now, emotions, it is a powerful tool. If you want to move someone in moving something, you have to move his emotions. You have to go through his emotions. And sometimes this is, you know, in a way, uh, a, a bad thing because what we have, what we call emotional blind spots. And just like what we have been discussing in our Bible study every, every Wednesday, okay, about musical instrument, uh, instrument in, in worship, I guess some tend to be drawn by, by, uh, by their emotions. That's why they go to congregations that have musical instrument in worship because of the, the feeling of euphoria, right? Meaning a heavenly feeling that they are feeling when they are entering and worshiping God with so many instruments and with lights and sometimes uh, there are those who are using smoke as an effect because they want the people to want to draw their emotions and when you connect to the emotions that's a powerful tool but again we are exchanging the truth to our own emotional satisfaction to our own euphoric experience but nonetheless uh, again we are exchanging that for the truth because of the emotional satisfaction that we are getting from this kind of worship. Okay. In Genesis chapter 4, 5 to 7, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor, referring to God. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what's right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now, God told Cain to rule over what? Rule over his emotions. Okay. God knew that sin was crouching at the door of Cain's heart, you know, ready to take him captive and commit a grave sin for the Lord. Now, Cain could have rectified his wrongdoings. Cain could have verified the wrong kind of offerings to God and made himself right before God. But no. Instead of doing the right thing before the Lord, he lets jealousy consume him and turn that jealousy into anger. Emotions were so overwhelming in Cain's heart that he committed a grave sin before the Lord, that he killed his brother Abel. Okay. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, the Passion Translation of the Bible, but don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge, not for even a day. See, the Lord wants all of us to take hold of our emotions, to control that emotions of ours. And God said, don't let anger control you or if you will for, re for revenge, not even for a day. Now, with the emotional blind spot that we have, what is the cure? Emotions do not define truth. Bible does. Your emotions, even how euphoric you feel, even how heavenly you are feeling, that is not the basis of truth. We have to go to the Bible where the truth lies. Okay. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. What is the truth? Thy word is truth. What they're holding in your hands, whether it be your cell phone or a, a book of Bible, your, what you are reading is the truth. The word of our Lord, the message of God, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Make them holy. 
to sanctify, to make them holy, to separate them for special purpose. Through what? Through the word. Because the word is truth. You know, the immersion of the Bible is a definitive way of mastering our emotions, controlling our emotions because it gives us wisdom. If we will not open the pages of the Bible and if we will not let the Bible rule our hearts, then we will be ruled by our emotions. Okay. And wisdom or intellect, you know, it should be far superior. It must be far superior than our emotions. Again, as I have been uh, saying in our Bible study, our intellect, our mind, our wisdom, our intellect must lead our emotions, not our emotions leading the intellect. We must be guided by the truth. We must not be guided by our emotions. And if you are guided by your emotions, make sure that your emotions are rightly guided by the truth. And you can have the truth by going through the pages of the Bible. So sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is true. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Feelings, emotions. If a person is so guided by his own emotions that he is forgetting about the truth, the Bible said, you are a fool. You are exchanging the truth for your emotions. But whoever walks wisely or with wisdom will be delivered, you see. Intellect, our wisdom from knowing the truth is far more superior than our emotions. The second blind spot, speaking of intelligence, Wisdom is about intelligence blind spot, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger, both individuals, they are a uh, renowned um, psychologist. And Dunning-Kruger effect is a type of cognitive bias in which people believe they are smarter. They are smarter and more capable than they are. Essentially, low ability people do not possess the skills needed to recognize their own incompetence. The combination of poor self-awareness and low cognitive abilities leads them to over, overestimate their capabilities. It simply shows how people tend to see themselves as better and smarter than other people because of their acquired knowledge, because of their skills, because of their learnings, and even because of their status in life. Those that are high in the society, those that have so much learnings, they think that they are more privileged than those who are less in society. And they believe that you should listen to them and not them listening to you. And it is a kind of, actually, a kind of perception. What I think of you. That's what basically they are saying. I think smarter than you are because of what I have. And you are less smarter than I am because of what you have or what you don't have. So you see, it's a kind of perception thing. Okay? It is a kind of perception they have in themselves because of their status in life and education they had. Okay? When in fact, the truth of the matter is they really have a low ability and knowledge of what is being discussed on the matter at hand. Now, these people, according to the, to the study, they unduly overestimate their abilities because of their credentials. Even though, if they do not know anything about what is being discussed, they will tell you anything and they will tell it like they are the authority because they feel they are far more superior than you are. What made them superior is because of their education, because of their status in life, okay. affiliations. See? So that's why these people, they feel far more superior than other people because of those credentials. But in fact, they don't know anything about what is being discussed. Okay. Now, we talk as if we are the true source and authority of the information we are saying, and what others say is irrelevant. Now, in Christianity, 
It's hard to say, but it is true. In Christianity, it does not differ. We also do the same. Uh, the theology degrees, the institutions, the person came from, and this pulpit, this pulpit, somehow they become a badge of honor for people like myself. It becomes a badge of honor as if, you know, whatever you say, it does not matter to me because I know it only. Because I am here, you are there. I am speaking, you are listening. I am standing and you are sitting. So what matter is what I say. See, perception. And that is a very dangerous thing, blind spot. Okay. Now, if I have a bachelor's degree, add to my bachelor's degree, master's degree, and add to my master's degree, a doctorate, and back it up with 20 years, for example, of preaching and going and speaking to hundreds and thousands of people. Now, what do I have? I am more than you are. I will not be sitting down there and listening to Brother X. I will not be sitting down there listening to Brother Derek. I would rather be standing up here and do all the talking. Why? Because I have my own bias. That's a blind spot. That's a blind spot. You know, we are forgetting one important lesson in life. And what is that? Learning never stops. And you can learn from other people as well. Okay. I can learn when Brother Carlos is standing up right here talking. I can learn from Brother Rex. I can learn from Brother Derek, from Brother Charles, if they're the one standing up here and I am there sitting, taking notes, reading. You know why? Because we have different views. God gave us different views. We look at things differently. We look at things differently, you see. And sometimes we see scripture very differently. See, I see it that way. Brother Charles would see it this way. And I was like, wow, I never thought the scriptures like that. You see, I can learn from his vast knowledge. I can learn from many people. I can learn from you. You see, that is what uh, we are totally forgetting, that we can learn from each other. Okay. Now, the Dunning-Kruger refers to this phenomenon, what they call as a dual burden. They have what they call dual burden. People are not only incompetent when they seem to be know all. The dual burden is that people are not only incompetent. Their incompetence robs them of the mental ability to realize just how inept they are. Just how incompetent they are. Because they are so blinded by their own perception of themselves that they are not seeing they are actually incompetent. Ouch. It hurts. right? But it doesn't hurt them because they are not seeing that. And that is a dual burden. You are actually incompetent according to the study. You are actually incompetent the second or the dual burden is that you are not seeing that in yourself. Okay, dual burden. Now what happens is that we overestimate our skill levels. And as we do that, in reality, actually, we are, our, our skills, our competency is actually just par or actually below par. See? Now, we also fail Second, we also fail to recognize the genuine skills and expertise of other people because we are so deeply uh, embedded in our own self that we are not seeing the competency of other people. Okay? Their skills and their expertise. And as you see them, they are actually more above our own expertise and our own skills and knowledge. And as we overestimate our skill levels, this enables us to fail to recognize our own mistakes. 
our own lack of skill because again we are so blinded by our thinking that we are superior to other people and you are inferior in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 19 for it is written the lord said i will destroy the wisdom of the wise i bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent or the intelligent one you see our wisdom if you kind of think of it our wisdom supposed to help us see the god of this world our wisdom supposed to lead us to god lead us to the truth and to acknowledge god but instead our intelligence our wisdom blinded us to even truly acknowledge the lord for what he does especially for sending his own son jesus christ on the cross for our sins See? now paul in his letter to the first conscience you know he was describing to the jews when he wrote this he was describing to the jews and the gentiles because the jews and the gentiles they saw the cross of our lord jesus christ as what as foolishness if you will read first corinthians chapter one they saw the cross as foolishness <clears throat> it was claimed uh, that uh, when someone died on roman cross like jesus did and to die for our sins it was foolishness it was a sign of weakness see and it was actually a mockery of being god when jesus claimed to be the son of god and claimed to be god and die as a uh, die on a, on a cruel death on the cross to them that is a mockery that is a mockery see that is why the death of christ for them is foolishness because for them no god or those who claim to be god will ever die on the cross and will never die for somebody else so god said i will destroy the wisdom of the wise see we know that the gentiles they are very wise they're very intelligent individuals the greeks so god said i will destroy their intelligence because it's, it's blinded them to see the truth and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent or the understanding of the intelligent now if you want to see how intelligent or rather how foolish our intelligence is you want to see now let's go to the bible and see how our supposed wisdom works in isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 now, i want you to see this the bible said what sorrow for those or who for those who say that evil is good and good is evil can you imagine we are supposed to be an intelligent being and we call good evil and we call evil good. the dark is light and light is dark you see day there is light but to the intelligent to the wisdom to the wise they will tell us oh it's dark it's dark here but no it's light you have so many lights but for the wise, they will tell us it's dark. You see how that, that's how our wisdom works. And that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Can you imagine when you tasted something's bitter and you say, wow, it's sweet? Or oh, taste it, you know, Sister Faye, taste it. It's really sweet. When Sister Faye tasted it, it's bitter. No, it's sweet. You see? that's how intelligent we are see how, how really funny is it see that's how our wisdom works we call the sweet bitter and we call bitter for sweet and god said i will destroy your intelligence i will destroy your wisdom and you know the story of the tower of babel right well the tower of babel the story is a classic example of man's foolish use of his intelligence now, God's given the people back then their wisdom and their ability to be so skillful, you know, their hands. 
Okay? And they exhibited an engineering prowess. When they build a city, they build a, a structured city, a large city and with a tower in their, in their midst. Okay? Now, let's go to Genesis 11.4. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens <clears throat> so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. You know what? The sin of the people at the Tower of Babel is not only the sin of pride. The other story about the sin of the, the people during the Tower of Babel story is that the sin of defying God's command. Because God gave them a specific command after the flood. Okay? In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. See, God commanded Noah and those that after them to subdue the earth, to fill the earth. But these people, they don't want to be scattered. So they are actually defying the command of God. Okay? Now the people use their intelligence. They build a structured city and they thought to themselves so that we will not be scattered. So we'll just stay here. But God explicitly told them to fill the earth, to be to scattered everywhere. But no, they have used their God-given wisdom and knowledge to build a structured city for themselves so that they will not be scattered and they build a tower. Okay. Thus, they are going against the command of God. See, sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters and friends, we are using our intelligence to defy the command of God. Right? We use our wisdom to rebel against God. So what is the, the solution? The solution is actually spiritual, intellectual humility. Intellectual humility. Intellectual humility <clears throat> is simply our ability to recognize that our judgment, your judgment, our rationality, and even our belief might be sometimes wrong. Right? That is intellectual humility. And as we recognize this, we also recognize that the judgment of other people, that the rationality of other people might be right. That is intellectual humility. Now, how do we do this spiritually? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are, not, are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, spiritual intellectual humility, my dear brethren and friends, therefore, is threefold. Number one, it is our recognition of the limitations of our wisdom when compared to God's wisdom because his thoughts are way higher than our thoughts. Now, second, it is recognition, the recognition that our intellect is God's blessing. We don't acquire them. It was given to us by God in the first place. Third, our ability to use our intellect for God's glory. Never use your intelligence to defy God. Never use your wisdom to rebel against God. Remember that the created, we are, the created cannot be any higher than the Creator. Amen? We, cannot be, we cannot be higher than the Creator. No way that we can be higher than God. To say that this world, you know, that this world and us human beings came about not by God's creation, it's actually an insult to the Almighty God. Okay? As if we are saying that God is incapable of creating anybody he wishes. Okay? And also to prove and say that God came from something. You know, as mind, as man's mind will tell us that everything must have a beginning, right? In our own intellect, 
we try to prove the existence of something because in our mind we learn or you know we try to adapt the thinking that everything must have a beginning so therefore in our own future mind we are now trying to prove that god came from something you see foolishness foolishness it is actually another insult to god see god is beyond time god is beyond space now if god can be defined by time and space therefore he's not god right a sovereign godly being cannot be created but rather he is the source of all creation if therefore god was created he is not sovereign he is not a godly being and that is not the god of the bible and that is not our god now for god we all know that god created everything okay so spiritual intellect uh, spiritual intellect humility is accepting those facts and that God truly is above our wisdom. Now, lastly, we have the hurts of the past blind spot. Do you know that so many relationships, and to this day, up to this very moment, there are so many broken relationships, see, husband and wife, family. See, you don't have to be living separately to say that you have a broken relationship. The study shows that uh, many married couples, they still live together under one roof, but they're actually living a separate lives, or what we call a broken relationship. Okay. You know, one of the most common things that in a relationship that holds them back from restoring the relationship is the hurt of the past. Okay. Because it is somehow still fresh, even it happened 20 years ago. It is still fresh in their mind, in their memories. They keep reminding themselves of how, how hurtful they were you know, all those years. And in doing that, what we are actually doing, in doing that, you know, the wounds can never heal. How can you heal a wound when you keep on opening it? When you keep cutting yourself, keep opening the wound, that wound can never heal. And you can never have a restored relationship. Okay. Now, second, we never get past the idea of what if scenario. See, the other problem with the past hurts is that we keep on adding or we keep on thinking of what if scenario. You know, Brother Mike, Brother Charles, what if he will do it again? It happened 30 years ago. What if after 30 years, what if he, he will do it again, Brother Tommy? What if she will do it again? You see, when you never get past of that what if, then you can never return or have a restored relationship. Third, is that the offended party is always the one making the effort. And somehow, if I am the offended party, my rationality would be, you know, I, I always uh, be the one to make the first move. I've been doing that for so many years. Maybe it's his time or her time to do that move. I'm tired of making the first move. You know, if you will be waiting and waiting and waiting for that person or, or your wife or your husband or your children to make the first move, probably it will never happen and you will never have a restored relationship. See, don't wait for the first move make the first move see now with this blind spot we will never really restore our relationship now what is the solution the solution just do it forgive and let go okay. i remember one time my story my true story when i hibernated for a decade they thought that i went abroad when i went back to church they were so glad to see me oh brother mike welcome back how how are you? And some people, they're asking me, oh, how's the U.S.? I was like, I've never been abroad. I'm always here in the city. Huh? You've been out for 10 years without your abroad? No. I'm just here, hiding myself. I'm just here, you know, 
hiding with my shame. Because at that time, I hibernated for a decade. And there was a time. I'm telling you this because I want to learn and to see my own experience. That, that, there was a time that I went out of the house. I'm already dressed up, ready to attend the church. I told the Lord, Lord, I'm coming back. Then I went out of the house, okay? And then after 10 minutes of waiting and waiting, I went back inside. My mom told me and asked me, Oh, you're done? You've been to church? The service is already done? No, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Probably next week. <laughs> I'll go next week. Then the following week, I went out again. The same thing happened. I'm so ashamed of myself. I cannot muster, you know, the strength to go to, to the church. And after one month, I went out again. I ride a tricycle or a jeepney. I'm outside of the building. I am right there across the street. Okay. I was standing. I was contemplating on entering. And then I went back home. Then I was asked again, oh, how fast? The, the service is already done? No. I did not go in. And then after two months, I was already inside the premises of the building. And I went again. I went home again. And finally, I told myself, if I will not forgive myself, nothing will ever happen. If I will not muster the strength to go inside and forgive myself, because I know the Lord has forgiven me. If I cannot forgive myself and just do it, I can never go back to God. I can never restore my relationship to God. Then I finally went back inside. I went inside, I sat at the back of the pew. And then after the closing prayer, I ran out. I was like a flash. They were looking at me. Where's Brother Mike? I was gone. And the following week, I was sitting right there again, the back. After the service, before they said amen, they mentioned my name. So I was, I was so ashamed to run uh, home again. So I stayed for a while. I stayed for three minutes, probably five minutes, then I went home. See? And then I'm here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see? If you will not master the strength to forgive, you can never have a restored relationship. That's the message. You see? No matter how hurt you are, you will be hurt. Yes. You will be hurt. It, it's hurtful. But no matter how hurt you were in the past, the Lord said that you must forgive. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God, just as in Christ, God forgave you, you see. We forgive. If you will not forgive, then you can never have a restored relationship. If I did not have the strength to forgive myself at that time, I would never be here. If you want to restore your relationship with your family, with your loved ones, with God, then move ahead. Do something. Don't wait for other people to do something. Because they are not moving. Do your part. Do your part. Forgive. Because God forgave you. The Lord is not low, slow in his keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The idea of this verse is how God is so merciful to us that every day when we wake up, God gives us a chance to repent of our sins and correct our mistakes. Now, who among us here have counted how many times you have committed sins to God? Have you ever counted your sins to God? Have you ever kept track of the record of your sins to God? Do you know how many times you sinned against God? Anybody here? Nobody keeps track. But we know, we know, and you know that we sinned many times to God. You see, the Bible tells us He's not slow. He's waiting for you, waiting patiently every morning, waiting patiently for you to come to Him. You see? If God's forgive you, then you have to forgive other people. That's a prerequisite. 
You need to forgive, even though how you've been hurt before. You have to forgive. Because God forgives you. God forgives us. See, many times we sin, God continually forgives us when we come clean to God and ask God for forgiveness. See? And should you not and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servants? I had mercy on you. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. You see, the servant, he was forgiven by the master. But when the servant saw someone that owes him, he did not forgive that person, even though he was shown mercy by the master. When the master learned about that, the Lord said, you, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. From your heart. See? That is the meaning of letting go. When you forgive, you let go. See? Letting go does not mean that you have to forget. It's impossible for us to forget. It will remain in our memory. But the Lord said, you forgive from your heart. When you forgive, that is letting go from your heart. When you forgive from your heart, that is letting go. What is our motion when you, when, you, uh, when you give to somebody? When you give, you open your hands, right? Your hands. When I'm giving this to Brother Charles, I'm opening my palm. Okay. So when you give, you are opening your hand for reconciliation. You are opening your hand towards relationship. Because when you do not forgive, you close your face like this. You are closing your heart for reconciliation. You see, that's a dangerous blind spot. See, that's why many people until now, they are so unhappy with their life. Pretending to be happy, but they are not. When they go to sleep at night, they are unhappy. Because they have this broken relationship with their family, with friends, and with other loved ones. You see? And then they have a broken relationship with God. See? Now letting go, again, doesn't mean that we forget. But it means that we don't dwell and live on the past church. When God chooses not to remember our sins in Isaiah 43, verse 25, that does not mean that God will have an amnesia. No. It only means that when we let go, it only means that we are not identifying that person with their sins. But we are identifying that person with love. We are identifying that person with Christ. Because God loved that person and because God loves you. See? And that is letting go. Forgive and let go. Okay. Now, brethren, friends, to enjoy a wonderful relationship with God and with our loved ones, Let's be aware of our blind spots. And as we become aware of it, okay, make sure to plot yourselves with humility. As I, always, as I always say, we can never go wrong with humility. And finally, let me leave all of us with this verse. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For those that are here that have not yet accepted the Lord, the invitation is yours. Please come forward, accept the Lord in your heart and in your life. Make him as your Lord and Savior. Accept him, repent of your sins, and be baptized in water. God bless us all. Good morning. So we all stand as we sing the song of invitation.